Well, thank you all for joining today. And hello, I'm Phil Carvel. I work as the Health Tech Cluster Manager for the Science and Technology Facilities Council, one of nine organisations which make up our UK research and innovation. Personally, I've been with SCFC for two years. I also work with Pride in STEM, a charitable trust run by independent group of LGBTQ plus STEM professionals. So, as it's Pride Month, as part of UKRI's Take Pride in Research and Innovation campaign, I'm here virtually with some fantastic colleagues from different organisations to have an open discussion about some of the challenges faced by LGBT people in the research and innovation sector, share our experiences, our observations, and really just uh, open that dialogue. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you one by one to introduce yourselves and where you're from. So can I start and invite please Izzy to kick us off? Uh, so my name is Dr. Izzy Jayasinghe. I'm a UKRI Future Leader Fellow. Um, I'm based in the University of Sheffield. Um, I also work with uh, a few organisations that um, champion uh, LGBTQI plus um, inclusion. So I work with LGBTQ plus STEM, uh, Tiger in STEM, and I also work uh, with the Women in Physics group in the Institute of Physics. Perfect. Thank you, Izzy. Tom, if I can invite you to uh, introduce yourself. So hello, I'm Professor Tom Welton. I'm Professor of Sustainable Chemistry at Imperial College. And in a few days time, um, after a year of waiting, I will be becoming the next president of the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, to which I was elected. And of course, part of um, that election was um, diversity. Thank you, Tom, and congratulations for, uh, for that position and the upcoming appointment. And Harsh, lastly, if I can ask you to introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Harsh Pershad. Uh, I identify as a gay man, as a British Indian. Um, I am an innovation leader, Innovate UK, part of UK Research and Innovation. Um, I also identify as a scientist, an artist, a musician, a dancer. But really, my main focus, especially in the workplace, is being passionate about science and research and applying that to solve societal problems, particularly climate change. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. That was such an eclectic and diverse mix of backgrounds there, uh, activities you're all involved in, and particularly identities as well. So I think that's really set up my next question. So I'm really interested to hear about everyone's experience of getting into research and innovation. Was it your childhood dream? Did you accidentally fall into it? Was it a straightforward university trajectory? Let's uh, mix up the order. So actually, Harsh, I'm going to start with you this time. Tell me about uh, your experiences and journey. Sure. So thanks, Phil. I uh, had always wanted to become a scientist. Um, I was lucky to do my undergraduate degree at Imperial College and was lectured by Tom, in fact, uh, for my final year, which was very exciting. I went on to do a PhD and uh, a couple of postdocs and I think what was really interesting then for me was the, the jump into industry that I made uh, when I was about 30 years old and I got to work for a consultancy that was working on climate change and low carbon strategies um, and I found that I could bring all of my research experience, my chemistry training, my scientific approach to trying to, to make to help people make better decisions on energy. And uh, then I found uh, that uh, I could work with lots of different people rather than being uh, focused on one narrow area. So it was, very, uh, it, was, it was very exciting for me to get to join UK Research and Innovation about five years ago. And since then, I've been able to work on all of my favourite chemical technologies, but apply them to tackle climate change. Uh, so it's been a really interesting uh, journey so far. Perfect. Thank you, Ash, for sharing that experience. And uh, obviously, really interesting journey there of going from the academic and actually fantastic to hear about the interactions with the group here already. So I'm sure we can delve into that a bit later on. Uh, Izzy, if I can invite you to tell us and share your journey experiences. I um, had an interest in science from a very young age, and that's probably helped by uh, the fact that both my parents worked in STEM. So medicine and engineering um, but science was sort of a distant um, dream um, and it remained that way until my final year in school um, when I did a project um, in physics where I built my little apparatus uh, and that 
project sort of grow into a bit of a monster and um that was sort of then um put forward to the the, the science fair the local science fair uh, which won me a scholarship to go to university to study science um and that kind of whetted my you know appetite to you know in terms of research and sort of designing your own experiment and i've kind of really never looked back and i've done the the typical taking the typical path of doing a phd and that's taken me halfway around the world so i did my phd in auckland in new zealand uh, and i did a postdoc uh, in queensland in australia and then another postdoc in exeter in the uk and that's sort of taken me on a journey to becoming uh, an independent researcher um and now i'm sort of uh delving slightly into industry and and exploring my commercial options but i've kind of worked primarily as a uh a, a scientist sort of a, a kind of blue sky scientist and now a sort of a tech developer perfect thank you Izzy there and uh fantastic to hear almost your global story of how you've undertaken research innovation so some really interesting experiences we can delve into there as to how we might marry up with a other sort of research innovation ecosystems. Uh, Tom, uh, lastly, if I can invite you just to share your uh, experiences, please. So before I say this, I, I think I should say, I am extraordinarily happy with the way my career has turned out to be. And the choices that, that I ended up making turned out very luckily to be the right ones. But actually my career has been very much linear academic conveyor belt, I think you can call it. And the, a big part of the reason for that, certainly early on, was that I didn't know that there was any alternative. And so I grew up on a North London council estate. And, you know, luckily I went to a very good, supportive um, secondary school. And I became interested in science as a youngster, largely through James Burke, which... I'm probably the only one of us that's old enough to remember. Um, and he's television programmes. And so I was interested in science. I liked chemistry at school. And I didn't know that you could do science in a way which wasn't the way that it was done at school. So I thought, you know, your options for science at university would be chemistry, biology and physics and I, and I wouldn't, didn't know that something like pharmacology existed and so I didn't have the choice to do something I didn't know existed. I picked from the ones that I did know existed, what my favourite was, it was chemistry and I, you know, I went to the University of Sussex where I um, really enjoyed myself um, and again, but again there was kind of, other than uh, you know, going into marketing for a drug company, I <laughs> I wasn't really aware of non-scientific, non-conveyor belt careers. And so I just stuck with the conveyor belt. Now, as it happens, I think if I had known about those alternatives, the conveyor belt was still the right place for me. But that was a bit of luck as opposed to judgment. Okay. That's really interesting reflections there. And sort of a I say a linear conveyor belt career, uh, knowing that and not knowing or being aware about some of the other opportunities, and actually that uh, that really opens up the question of going. Do you think uh, the research innovation sector how is it generally perceived? Because uh, from your sort of aware uh, discussion there, you know, there's awareness of a very linear sector, working in a lab, going. Do you think it's now becoming more of a welcoming, diverse sector where people are aware of these opportunities, but also. Uh, sort of richness of ideas and uh, trajectories coming in or do you think there's still a perception that it's exclusive so um, Harsh would you like to give maybe some reflections on this from your side so I think that um, for better or for worse a lot of the research environment that I remember was a fairly conservative sector in that if you followed the path that um, your lecturers had followed, it, it felt like the dumb thing to do. It was a, there was a kind of a cultural norm around it. And as Thomas mentioned, I think unless you hear from other voices that there are alternatives, you wouldn't necessarily know that. And even if you know that, convincing other people to take risks with you 
it can be quite hard and it's hard it's really interesting to think how much progress there's been because uh, I remember when I applied for my postdoc, I'd been working during my PhD at Oxford on nickel enzymes. And I went to do a postdoc in uh, in New University of California in Berkeley um, in the US uh, on copper enzymes. And I had a reviewer that had uh, reviewed my grant. And he said, I'm not sure that Harsh will be able to make the huge jump from nickel enzymes to copper enzymes. And it's kind of just very illustrative of the... Um, that actually nowadays that things have really changed. I can't imagine any anything like that nowadays. Today, every researcher I meet is absolutely wedded to the fact that new ideas will come from collaborating outside of your current sector, that new that societal challenges require you to jump out of the training that you had in your degree. So data science is just important to chemistry as meteorology. So these I think there's been a real revolution in, in that. And I think that that's um, really helped the culture. So I find it a much more welcoming uh, sector that I interact with a lot. And I think that can be really interesting. No, it's really interesting. It's particularly on that sort of collaboration thought process, so how in now collaborating is seen as the way forward to really creating new partnerships and research ideas. Um, and I know we've got some really interesting international sort of flavors to people's experiences here. So I wonder if I could touch upon that sort of nuance, Izzy, in your experiences. So similar sort of question um, on the perception of the research innovation sector and how it's changed. What's your reflection on that, given that you've had that very much international flavor to your career? The very um, early sort of impression that I had in my mind about science or a career in science uh, was that it was a way to see the world. It was a way to work with people from diverse backgrounds. And this is the dream that you kind of, or at least I kind of had when I was a graduate student, uh, that, you know, you get to go to conferences overseas uh, and you get to work with people whose work you read on paper. And there is some truth to it. There is, you know, you, um, certainly it's expanded my horizons, you know, geographically as well as culturally. Um, I've, you know, gotten to know a lot more about people in the world. But in other ways, you know, it's been quite limited because, you know, the the role models that you get to commonly look up to tend to be, you know, cis white men um, you know, nine times out of ten, and that was the case, you know, when I was a graduate student and a sort of a young postdoc, and that is a situation that is that is changing. That's really interesting. There, hearing some of those limitations as well going, but also how those are shifting. So let's, uh, if we can pick on that a little bit more about how things are shifting and what maybe we can do to change sort of those historic perceptions, as it were, as to research innovation, those role models. Oh, what do you think, Tom? Considering now you're going to this very high-level elected position, the Royal Society of Chemistry, what do you think we can do to sort of change some of those perceptions to help people look beyond those uh, uh, previous perceptions of what a scientist, STEM professional is? So I think the first thing that we need to address, and I think we are addressing it slowly, is the idea of there being a diversity of successes. Uh, I think certainly when I was a student, the the way in which we felt, and I would go as far as say the way in which we were made to feel, was that continuation of the academic pathway was success. And if you failed at that, you might go and do something else like work in industry um, or take up some other kind of position. But the idea that there is only one kind of success, I think, is extremely limiting in many different kinds of ways. Because, of course, it, it limits the choices that we might make as individuals. But also, not just because of that, I think that, you know, diversity in the other way in which we talk about diversity, the diversity of peoples, would be more liberated in its implementation if we recognise that actually there are many ways of being successful, all of which should be equally respected, and then the both types of diversity could move forward together. Perfect. Thank you. That's, again, you know, going on that sort of trajectory that 
potentially that sort of academic career isn't the only one you can do and really trying to open it up and bringing that diversity to that sort of trajectory I think could have enormous impact and actually that leads on perfectly to my next sort of uh, question really so if we look more closely at that element at that research and innovation sector as you say often there's that need to focus on the science that academic career as you say with the person with a PhD going into an academic position purely on their work but when you think about those people those scientists going they are people at the end of the day they're not just process focused all the time so why do you think it's important that everyone feels comfortable to bring their whole self to work with them and how does that actually resonate with what you just what was just said there about sort of that diversity of people and diversity of positions within the research innovation sector tom shall we continue on that thread and then go around so any reflections there okay so so when i'm thinking about the discussion of bringing one's whole, whole self to work for me personally and i think for many people the thing that requires effort and activity isn't bringing your whole self to work the thing that would require effort and activity would be not bringing your whole self to work because you would be having to actively cover something up by not doing that I liberated that energy to be able to be used on actually part of it making me a better scientist and so I think it's absolutely vital that people do not waste their time and energy pretending to be something they're not. Excellent. Again, such an impactful statement there. And I think that sort of paradigm around that whole self to work and how that impacts on your energy as a professional. You know, I've, I'd love to delve into a few more of those nuances uh, with the other panellists. So Izzy, do you have any reflections on that yourself, particularly in how it impacts the research innovation sector? Um, I, again, echo everything that um, Tom said. Um, I personally, I came out as a trans woman uh, about 11 years ago to my cl closest friends. But then I found myself going back into the closet. Um, and I think the reason for that was mainly the insecurities around career and security and that kind of thing. And so I didn't really again come out until I had my first faculty position. And I completely um, relate to the idea that you're, you're compartmentalizing, you're, you're working, you're not working on off cylinders, you're, you're basically underpowered. But also it impacts negatively in the sense that you know that you're not being authentic uh, and, you know, true of who you are with your friends, your colleagues. Um, and and that, that is a, a real handicap sometimes. No, absolutely. Um, no, I think that highlights there's still some opportunities to really delve into, to open up, for particularly early career professionals, as well as sort of the wider community and uh, sector as a whole. Um, I don't, Izzy, do you have any more reflections on that sort of point at all? I just want to add that, you know, the, the thing that eventually catalyzed, you know, uh, the, the, the decision to actually be out was actually seeing um, others like myself, sort of trans people who were getting on with their scientific careers. So I think, you know, it can work both ways. It could be, you know, disheartening to see that you're, you know, yourself in the closet while the others are out, but at the same time, it can catalyze change um, in a more positive sense. And I'm glad that I got to know people like that. Absolutely. And let's let's just uh, fin finish this train of transport yourself, Harsh. Obviously, again, with your reflections on your career, you've gone from academic and industry, and also you know, in terms of the people you've interacted with along that journey and colleagues going, what's your reflection that whole um, bringing your whole self to work paradigm and how that shaped your career as well as where you see it in the current climate of the research innovation sector. Thanks Phil. So my views on this have changed quite a bit. I think right at the beginning of my career I used to think I used to want in fact that being gay would be a small or should be a small compartment of my life that didn't have any impact on my work and uh, and vice versa. But now I realise that I think being gay uh, affects many parts, possibly every part of my life, including my work. So uh, in terms of the decisions I've made, um, for example, choosing safe places to work, safe places to live, um, has been really important. And I think that one of the things that uh, drives a perception of safety, uh, real or imagined, is uh, visibility, as Izzy has said, of 
people that one can relate to. And I think that that's been really important for me. And it's one of the reasons why uh, initially I wasn't sure about uh, participating in this uh, podcast, but actually thinking about the um, the need for visibility or the value the, the value of visibility has um, has how it's helped me in the past uh, made me think okay this is this is something that I could engage with but I think like Izzy's mentioned it's very easy to step back into a closet mode or because we live in very dynamic work environments nowadays people change jobs and working patterns very often where frequently attending, uh, say, for example, a conference or a working group where you really are meeting people in a very narrow construct. And so it can be difficult to bring all of yourself to those conversations, even though you might hear others at the meeting being very comfortable with that. So I find that um, constantly interesting. No, absolutely. And I've really resonated with some of those views about compartmentalizing. You know, you were thinking, oh, being gay would be just a that's one element. And then I'm working going and I, I've been guilty of that in myself in my sort of journey as well of thinking going I'll address being gay later but I've got to do my job now so and it's really interesting to see how that's changed now both as I I personally have changed uh, changed as well over my life as well as you know being observing that as well so I'd love to delve on you know just a, personally as well into what do you think are some of the ways the research innovation sector can better support the LGBT community So I don't know uh, if there's anyone who would like to start on that one. Okay, let's start with this. Um, My personal view is that um, if you want to build visibility and inclusion in sort of a STEM environment, you need to lift the barriers that are preventing these minorities from accessing funding. Um, and now the UKRI at the moment is going through a review of um, things like success rates in in um, in funding applications across uh, in in terms of characteristics like you know gender, in terms of race. That kind of data don't exist for LGBTQI people, and so we haven't even admitted that there might be a problem. Uh, and I think that identifying if there's a problem and lifting those barriers will first and foremost will help uh, LGBTQI people progress in in scientific and technology careers, both the visibility and the presence and the access for these communities in in STEM research and innovation. No, I think those are some fantastic things referenced there, the ongoing reviews, how it's been done in those other sort of communities, and how that data isn't actually there for the research innovation sector yet potentially for us to action. So, Tom, I wonder if you had some commentary as well, you know, based on what Izzy was saying there about how we can improve the research innovation sector for this community. So I think one of the things that, you know, over the lifetime of my career, formal procedures have changed in a positive way. I had friends who lost jobs, were taken off of projects because they were LGBT plus. And, you know, that was a perfectly legal thing to do. And those kinds of procedures were in place in in places. Now they're not. You know, the, the procedures, the laws, all those kinds of things are in place to prevent those kinds of things from happening. But then, of course, you get the actual practices that people experience on the ground. And in a way, that's the toughest nut to crack because you can't do it just by making a diktat that this shall happen. And it is about a community response. It is about a cultural response. It is about people being inclusive. And, you know, and it's not... In itself that difficult in being inclusive starts with being welcoming and you know and we are all capable of doing that and I would say you know of anybody whose experience is different to mine um, for whatever reason that might be the that welcoming first starts with listening just listening and hearing what those different experiences were and and do you know what I, I think a lot of people get very nervous about being curious and I can tell the difference between when somebody is being 
curious as to how my experience is different to them and when somebody is being bloody nosy and don't I would say I would say to people don't be frightened of being curious ask if you're wondering is that is that does that feel different for you ask does it feel different for you and be willing to listen to the answer and I and so I think on that kind of community level those are the kinds of things that will really make a difference to how comfortable someone feels, how welcomed they feel into the environment, and then ultimately how included in the projects and et cetera that, that they are. Absolutely. And I think that as uh, researchers and professionals, curiosity, uh, I, I believe, is firmly embedded into who we are as people, curious, asking questions particularly where we've been talking about the research innovation sector, you know, our experiences, the barriers, the what we could maybe be tackling. Because this is the pandemic this year, you know, prize year is obviously very different to what it usually is. We also see an incredibly important moment as well as we've touched on in terms of the fight for racial equality with the Black Lives Matter movement. So what do you think we can do to better support the black community and create pathways for black researchers and also more diversity in the research and innovation sectors, particularly to succeed? We talked about a bit earlier, so Izzy, about some of those uh, uh, the reviews going on within UKRI. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think this is a really good opportunity to have a really good self-reflection of how we as a research and innovation community uh, look in terms of diversity and one thing that was really striking that um, occurred to me that there are no queer people of colour in the professorial level in the UK in STEM and we talked about how few black professors there are in general and this is a really good time to actively think about what we can do to to lift the barriers, to allow these people um, from different communities, different life experiences to progress and share their experiences. No, I think that's a great reflection there. One of the things we touched upon earlier was that visibility. So seeing fantastic role models in those positions and having, you know, those inspiring you. So actually, I'd like to almost go back a little bit in sort of our thought process for all of you here going who were those sort of role models for you did you have an lgbtq plus role model that inspired you i'm gonna go go inverse harsh going from your experience did you was there a role model was there someone you looked up to um it took um it took a while and actually uh one of my fellow uh panelists tom welton was the very first person that i knew um, as being an out gay man in science, full stop. That was in 1996. And then even after that, I'd only ever seen a few LGBTQI individuals at the very junior levels, or even BAME uh, people at very junior levels, very few at middle levels. And of course, there are, if there aren't many at many middle levels, then of course, there won't be many at senior levels. And that's in research, that's in business, it's in government, it's in all of the sectors that I've worked in and I've seen lots of data that uh, reinforces what Izzy's been saying about that we're making some progress in, in, in small areas but we're, we're, I don't know if we're really shifting the needle in terms of having a broad level of visibility um, of LGBTQI individuals and I think that there's quite a lot that we can still do. I mean, people sometimes forget that freedoms uh, won through a lot of hard work can be easily lost when you take your foot off the uh, foot off the gas. So I think we ha- we we shouldn't forget the courage of those who are willing to put themselves out there at the beginning, and those the courage of those people who then follow on, and the courage of those people who follow after them. Because I think that's really important. I'm I'm seeing a lot of nods here on the screen, and I think you know if we uh, even now if we think about Pride, you know that all comes from, you know a lot of it comes from the Stonewall riots, you know the courageous you know efforts which were happening then in terms of really championing that movement, making progress and resisting, saying there needs to be change. Do you think that recognition is still there? Do you think more needs to be done in that space? Are we recognizing these fantastic role models or the impact? that these uh, Croatian people are having enough in progressing the equality movement forward. So anyone have some reflections on that at all? Tom? 
Yeah, so I, this kind of matters to me. <laughs> um, and for much of my career, I was just, oh my God, I'm it. <laughs> you know, that it's me. Although there were people around who were perhaps not quite as loud as me, but certainly there was, I couldn't, I couldn't see in advance of where I, at no point in my career could I see in advance of where I was someone that I could say, oh, they're in the place I was trying to get to. That, that person never existed. But I would say there are two elements of it. So we, we, we have talked about, you know, what we, the scientific community can do about it, but I think that we do have to really think very seriously and take a very serious look at ourselves as the LGBT plus community and say, who is it that we choose to celebrate? And every year in you know, one newspaper or another, you're, at this time of year, you will get a list of you know, the 50 most influential LGBT plus people you know, in the country or in the world or whatever the, you know, they decide to, to list it as. And you look down that list and you don't see a single scientist. And it's not now because those scientists don't exist. It's because we as a community do not value their contribution to society. So we as a community really need to take a good hard look at ourselves and say, what is it that we are valuing? How come this list has got, you know, a dozen cabaret performers on it and not one single scientist? I think that's an exceptionally important point there, particularly the value that we're putting on specific labels or specific professions. I mean, I think this blends on beautifully to the next point. I mean, do we think that equality, diversity and inclusion needs to be looked at, as we talked about earlier, in a more intersectional way rather than just one group? It needs to actually we need to open up a bit more and start raising up some of these role models. So, um, Izzy, do you have any commentary on this at all? Um, yes. So I think the, there's definitely more things that we as a community, um, the LGBTQI community can gain by opening up and celebrating the intersections. There's an incredible amount of resilience that we can actually gain as a community if we actually look across the board to you know some of the hardships that other groups have had historically. So one example is the, is the discussion around whether trans women and non-binary folk should be allowed in you know what we call safe spaces this is a discussion that is not new it happened many many decades ago to the to the black american community so at present day talking about the rights of trans people don't have to reinvent the wheel we just need to look across bring those experiences along and understand how that resilience and resistance was developed and and how we can uh, talk to the society broadly and and bring in support some in incredible points there incredible points there particularly about how we can learn well so this had this isn't a new thing it has happened before in other communities and really taking that learning taking those experiences recognize they happened and then actually think about where they're happening now, where we can actually champion and move things forward, particularly, you say, going in, in the transactional rights, the visibility in that community, and really think what action can be taken. I think that sort of, you know, almost uh, encapsulates it to uh, looking at uh, the whole sort of uh, acronym, really, LGBTQ+. Uh, what are some of the differences in the quality within that community, and how can we in both society and our sector work to improve that? I wonder, Tom and Harsh, if you have any sort of... Uh, comments at all from what you've observed. Do you have any reflections at all on that? Yeah, so inter intersectionality can be approached in two different kinds of ways, one of which I think is extraordinarily positive, which we've just heard from Izzy, which is about understanding how we are all multidimensional beings and that we can bring ourselves together around that idea, or it can be let's break ourselves down into ever more precisely defined groups that we use as a, as a vehicle to separate ourselves from each other. And that is incredibly damaging and does nobody any good because we are in fact all complex, multidimensional beings. And that's hugely positive. No, perfect. That's extremely powerful. And as you say, we start bringing in this sort of intersectionality 
uh, to it. I think that, you know, that opens up even more. So I'd actually like to bring this to a close and actually just ask uh, one question to each of you and just ask for your reflection. So this is, you know, STEM professionals, and that includes, you know, the spectrum of STEM from the arts and humanities, to the particle physics, to the engineering, mathematics, going, so why is it important as that sort of diverse, rich research innovation sector to be visible and support pride in support of all this? Harsh, do you want to start for us? Uh, I, so I think this is, um, this goes to the heart of uh, why we're talking today. And for me, we've learnt very brutally, it feels, with the coronavirus pandemic, that only when all parts of society act together based on the best available evidence uh, can we ensure that all of society benefits. And the LGBTQI community and BAME minorities in the UK or women in innovation and research are just as much part of the solution. And if you don't engage everyone, you won't end up with the full solution. So I think it's really about maximizing the ideas at the table, their execution, and also their adoption by society. Perfect. And if I can invite uh, Izzy next and then Tom, if that's okay, Izzy. I think it's uh, it's a really good opportunity that we have right now uh, where we've, as a community, worked to a level where there is some visibility within the community itself but i think the next step is to open the door and allow that visibility to inspire more people to to come through um and one thing that i learned when i was transitioning gender the idea that you know not running away from my past and living my my true self in the present will hopefully help someone else you know stop hiding from their future and i think what we are seeing now in the 21st century is you know some new generations coming into their prime in very different difficult circumstances the least we can do is open the door to the research and innovation in a community so that they don't have to hide a part of themselves and tackle the big problems of tomorrow and not having to compartmentalize and hide behind various things. Fantastic. Resonate with everything you were saying there and that opening that door. And Tom, going with that door wide open, what, what do you think? Okay, so follow that. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean I mean all I can all I can really do, honestly, is is, is agree with both Izzy and Harsh that, you know, it isn't just a matter of we are facing the most incredibly complex problems that the world needs to solve and you need the best possible collection of minds in order to do that and so so functionally you 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 better be inclusive because that's what you need there are generations and generations to come and they do need to be inspired into wanting to work on the, those kinds of problems. They do need to be inspired into wanting to become a scientist, an engineer, or, you know, a musician or artist, whatever it is that they find inspiration in. And to do that, you have to be visible. Things are, things are way better than they used to be, but equally well, that doesn't mean that we've completed our path down whichever way we are going to end up going and we do need to carry on no and i i think to bring all those points together i think anything we are uh, doing all we can to really sort of acknowledge you know that sort of path that we all had sharing those experiences raising that sort of visibility going and you know acknowledging it hasn't been enough and it we can do more it's not just now, it's for the future, to inspire that next generation to really work on those problems. No matter where we are in our career, we should always be proud of who we are, we should always still be curious, and should always try and bring ourselves more together. So I want to actually personally thank each and every one of you, Izzy, Tom, Harsh, for, your, for sharing your stories, being visible, and that absolutely fantastic conversation. So uh, thank you everyone who's contributed today, both yourselves and everyone behind the scenes as well. And uh, it's been great to have this conversation and I look forward to having the conversation again, moving it forward and to seeing what, you know, what can we can really do to bring about 
better and greater change to really lead to world leading impact research and innovation and a fantastic dance along the way. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.